Hello, you guys. Welcome back. Thank you all for joining. I uh, know I was out a couple weeks, but I am grateful to be back to share with you the word of God. Um, we will begin with a salvation prayer for anyone who wants to be saved, anyone who wants to become a Christian but doesn't know where to start. You can repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I come to you in repentance asking for your forgiveness of my sins. I believe in my heart that Jesus died for my sins and rose from the dead. Just as your word says in Romans 10 and 9, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I also hold unto the promise of John 3.16, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Whosoever, that includes me. So Lord Jesus, I confess you as my Lord and Savior, and I ask you to come into my heart. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, so I may live a life that pleases you. Thank you for your grace, your mercy, and most of all, the gift of salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you said that prayer and you believed it and you meant it and it came from your heart, your soul, then you're saved. You are saved. You are that one that Jesus will leave 99 to go after. Do you not know when you said that prayer, you became a Christian, you became a Christ follower? And the angels in heaven are rejoicing. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. So um, now we will say a prayer and we will dive into our reading. So, Father God, we thank you for this opportunity once again to read your word, to expound on your word. We thank you for giving us your divine wisdom, understanding, and knowledge of your word. Heal us by your word. Deliver us by your word. Help us to hide the word in our hearts so we don't sin against you. Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So last week, um, well, a couple of weeks ago, we read, we're, we're actually in the book of Matthew, or, or book of Matthew chapter 26. And last week we was at the 13th, I think it was, uh, what verse was, I think it was, oh gosh. Oh, verse 14. And it talked about how Jesus agrees to betray Judas. He went to the chief priests, asked them, what are they willing to give him to deliver Jesus unto them? They gave him 30 pieces of silver. From that point on, Judas' mission was to deliver Jesus unto the chief priests to have him killed. And it talks. we also talked about in verse 17 on down, uh, Jesus celebrates Passover with the disciples. On the day of the feast, um, the disciples came to Jesus and they wanted to know where do he want them to prepare the, um, the, the, the feast. And so Jesus told them to go to a city, uh, to a certain man rather. And um, the teacher says, well, I'm sorry. And Jesus told them to go to a certain man and say to them, the teacher says that the time is now. Um, and I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did just what Jesus told them to do. And moving on while they were actually at their table eating and sharing food, Jesus told them that, you know, one of y'all are going to betray me. And they got exceedingly sad, exceedingly sorrowful. And they were asking, Lord, is it I? And Jesus had said, um, it's the one who dips his hand with me in the dish. That's the one that's going to betray me. And so um, Judas then uh, said, <laughs> Rabbi, is it I? And he said, you have said it. Okay. So all the time, for a long time, rather, I I kind of felt at some point a little bad for Judas, like I did, 
because I'm like, he's in the presence. He was a disciple of Jesus Christ. How come or why maybe it was him? Or did it was like it was like was it a setup? Like, you know, in my in my immature mind and how God works, which I still don't know, you know, how could I ever know how God works? Um I just I know the things he do in my life, but God is God. He can do whatever. And uh, but anyway, I just was like, what you know, why? Like how why did it turn out that way? But anyway. I come to realize, and I also heard someone say that that was the heart of Judas. Judas was motivated by money in a very selfish way. Um, Money can motivate you, but don't let it be just for self-gain, you know? And, of course, the scripture says the the, the love of money is the root of all evil. Money, of course, we know helps the world go around. However, um, we can't love it because a lot of times people who love money would do anything to get it right, um, so the love of money is the root of all evil. Not the not money, just the love of it. Uh, but Judas, Judas was that person. He 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 kept the money, and he was still in the money. So when Jesus, I believe, when Jesus sought after someone to betray him, it was already someone that would betray him for money, right? And that's exactly what Judas did. He betrayed Jesus for thirty pieces of silver. All right, so uh, moving on, what we're going to do is we're just going to go ahead and um, dive into our um, into our reading here, and um, we're going to start with the thirty first verse. Again, we are in Matthew twenty six, so thirty four, uh, thirty one through thirty two verse, and it says, "And Jesus said to them, This night you will all fall away on account of me.'" For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Good news right there. Now, to explain this, Jesus is telling his disciples that they will abandon him that very night. He refers to a prophecy in Zechariah 13 and 7, indicating that his suffering will shake even his closest followers. Despite the betrayal, Jesus, however, assures them of hope by mentioning his resurrection and reunion, reunion rather, with them in Galilee. Now, that is what we look for. We, as Christ followers, we look for the return of Christ because we want to be part of those that he died for and and, and those that he's going to come back for, right, so that we can reign with him forever. And um, experience this world as he as he wanted it to be before the fall of man. All right, and now we're going to read uh, thirty three through thirty five verse. So Peter replied, "Even if I fall away on account of you, I will. I will. I never will." He said, Peter said, even if all, he said, all, meaning the other disciples fall away on, ca- on account of you, I will never. Truly I say to you, Jesus answered, this very night, Peter, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me. You will disown me. Not one or two, but three times. Now I'm adding that one, not one, not one, not two. Um, you know. um, but Peter declared, even if I have to die for you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same thing. And to explain this, Peter is, in his zeal rather, insists he would never abandon Jesus, even if the others do. Jesus, however, foresees that Peter would deny him, not one or two, but three times before the dawn. Peter's response reflects his loyalty, but it also shows a lack of understanding of his own weakness. The other disciples echo Peter's declaration, revealing their silence by, or should I say, I don't know, revealing their sincere but fragile faith. Um, Verse uh, 36, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. We'll explain that. So Jesus led his disciples to Gethsemane, a garden where he often went to pray. Here he separates himself from the group to pray alone. The city symbolizes a place of pressing, 
just as olives are like pressed to produce oil, showing that Jesus is about to face intense pressure and suffering. Verse 20, uh, 37 through 38, he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and, and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. We will explain that. So Jesus brings Peter, James, and John, his closest companions, um, deeper into the, the garden. He expresses his deep anguish and, and asks them to just keep watch. This moment shows Jesus' humanity, his humanity, and his need for support from his friends as he prepares to face immense suffering. Oh my gosh. Um, verse 39 says, going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken away from me, yet not as I will, but as your will. An explanation of this, Jesus prays earnestly, asking God to take the cup of suffering from him, if possible, yet he submits fully to God's will. This prayer reflects Jesus' obedience and his willingness to bear, the, to bear the cross, even though his humanity feels the weight of the impending suffering. Because remind you, he is both man and spirit, man and God, if you will. So he felt the weight of the world. He, he feels, he felt, he experienced every emotion, every pain that we could feel as human beings. He felt that while on this earth. Um, Matthew uh, 26, verse 40 through 41. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter, watch and pray so that you will not fail or fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I tell you, that's the truth. And I'm going to add something to that. Um, in, in, this, in this body that we live in the flesh and we have the soul and we have the spirit, there's like a tripod, if you will, of, a, of, a, of our existence. So I don't know if that's the right word I should use, tripod. But anyway, um, there's three parts to us. So the spirit belongs to God. The soul is our emotions, um, you know, why we think and feel the way we do. Um, and then we have this this old dirty dog flesh. <laughs> Lord, forgive me that I should probably shouldn't have said that. But anyway, this flesh wants what it wants 100% of the time. Period. Save, sanctify, filled with the Holy Ghost. Your flesh, the Bible says there's no good thing that dwells in the flesh. Your flesh wants what it wants all the time, right? Now, and it will get what it wants all the time. If, however, you're not feeding your spirit man because if you feed if you if you feed your spirit man usually the flesh and the spirit this flesh and the soul is going to kind of come sub subject to the spirit it's like whichever one you feed the most that's going to be the stronger one so if you're feeding your spirit your soul and your flesh is going to follow suit to a degree that's this is my whole theory of it all right but however, if you and, and feeding your spirit is reading your word, praying, fasting, you know, committing yourself to the things of God, mostly, right? However, on the on the contrary, if you say didn't read, didn't study, just watch TV like I do <laughs> a lot. Um, if you and I kind of mix them up, but anyway, you, if, if if you're not fasting, if you're not praying, if you're not studying, if you're not doing the things of God, um, your, your flesh can be weak, right? And so you, you would just begin to do the things that your flesh wants mostly, okay? Whatever that might be, all right? So it's important to feed your spirit person, your spirit man, so that you can live a victorious as much as possible uh, walk as a Christian, you know, as a Christ believer. And, and, and that is following what he is commanding us or what he is telling us we have to do based on the word of God, right? And then too, when you're feeding your spirit, you want to do 
the things of God, right? You don't desire to to to, to indulge your flesh or, or, or oblige your flesh, if you will. All right. So uh, let's see. Where are we? So we will we will read. Uh, uh, verse 42 through 40, uh, just 42 right now. He went away a second time and prayed, my father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. So Jesus prays a second time, affirming his submission to God's plan. This prayer is similar to the first, but shows Jesus. Okay, let me read that again. This prayer is similar to the first one, but shows Jesus deepening acceptance of the suffering he must endure for all humanity's sake. Um, verse uh, 43 through 44, when he came back again, he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Now, Jesus, um, he returns to his disciples and began to, or should I say, and, and, and again, finds them asleep. They was asleep, emphasizing their inability to stay alert. He then prays a third time, showing his persistent commitment to God's will. This repetition underscores the depth of his struggle and his unwavering obedience. Um, So that passage or this passage that we just read, and actually, let me go ahead and read. I guess I could finish this up. Verse 45 um, says, Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour, it is, it is at hand, and the Son of Man... It, excuse me, is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Okay, so um, to explain this, so basically Jesus tells them to rise and go. And um, as his betrayer Judas is approaching, so in this moment, Jesus shows incredible courage and, and readiness to face his suffering, knowing it is part of God's redemption plan. He, he steps forward willingly, setting an example of obedience and surrender to God's will, even when it leads to the hardship and pain. Um, so basically, the passage, all of this that we just read, um, Reveals Jesus' foreknowledge of his betrayal and abandonment, his profound anguish, and, and his ultimate submission to God's will. His disciples' repeated failure to stay awake highlights, however, human weakness. Human weakness, contrasting with Jesus' strength and devotion. It's important to understand who you are in Christ. Okay? The world put so much emphasis on, you know, self-love, self, you know, anything to do with self, to uplift self, to uplift self. Um, and I guess that sounds good, but know your own identity. And I feel like you can know your own identity through Jesus Christ. Um, you can know your, your inabilities, your, your strengths, your weaknesses through Christ, you know. Um, he will strengthen you when you're weak. He will um, give you what it is that you need as long as you're staying before him. And um, and when I say stand before him, you, you did the, what we talked about earlier, you're fasting, you're praying, seeking him, communing with him, like talking with him, you know, having heart to heart with him, you know, just loving him as he, you know, love you, you know, he always love you. Um, appreciating him, being grateful to him. Um, he, he will walk with you. He will talk to you. The Holy Spirit will guide you as well. Um, so yeah, thank you all for listening. Hope you enjoy the word. I pray that you, that the Holy Spirit reveals truth to you through his word and that you're able to apply the word of God to your life some kind of way. Um, 
in, in what we read. You all have a great evening. Thank you and goodbye for now.